we thought it would be helpful if you were unable to attend Manufacturing Day to have this webinar with some bearing basics and information that we shared with the local community then. I really look forward to share this information and tips for precision bearing. We will be diving into many topics like bearing applications, do's and don'ts of mounting bearing, precision bearing, greasing, and much more. I would first like to give a quick introduction to uh, about action and Emerson bearing. At the end of this meeting, I'll be glad to answer any questions and we can help you out. If not, always feel free to be in touch with me personally. Okay, now moving on to a little description about action and Emerson bearing. For over 50 years, Emerson Bearing and our New England affiliate, Action Bearing, have had bearings on the brain. We are the ball and roller bearing experts serving the OEM and maintenance markets throughout the United States as well as international markets. Our company offers a market solution approach. We target specific industries, learn about their particular uses and bearing needs, and supply exactly what is required. It typically offers several price alternatives. We have specialists on staff who understand these markets and can respond promptly. We also serve as bearing detectives. Some bearings are more difficult to find than others. If we don't have what you need in our 25,000 square foot warehouse, we will search our worldwide network to find it whether it's a 3 millimeter ID gyroscope bearing or 480 millimeter ID spherical roller bearing for a paper mill. We can also help you identify your bearing. Just tell us the dimensions and we'll do the rest. Now, in terms of the next slide showing what is a ball bearing. To the layman, a ball bearing may be a pair to like an art form, it's very artistic. You see them in some graphic pictures sometimes with the perfect symmetry of shiny spheres and perfectly machined races. To the engineer, however, ball bearings are a vital element in a system capable of supporting moderate to heavy radial and axial loads for thousands of hours. These works of art are actually capable of operating at radial speeds of 100,000 RPM and higher. To meet demanding application requirements, precision ball and roller bearings conform to international standards in terms of boundary dimensions and levels of precision, referred to as ABEC or ISO classes, which we'll touch on further down the road. The great news is that bearings conform to these universal standards that were set up in the early 1900s. And regardless of where bearings are manufactured, the part number Conform, if it's a same part number, it should, in theory, conform to the same standards. Now, while we take a look at a brief history of bearing, Leonardo da Vinci is officially credited with discovering the principles of bearing function in the 15th century. He realized that friction could be further reduced if the balls of a bearing did not touch one another. He subsequently developed separators, what we now call a retainer or cage, for use between the balls, allowing them to move freely around the retaining ring. His retained ball bearing concept is illustrated in the sketch below. Leonardo's ball bearing was reinvented again in the 18th century when a horse carriage axle was fitted with a ring of balls rotating in grooves cut into the axle. With the advent of the Industrial Revolution during the 19th century, bearing applications were everywhere. And the bearing was further developed and refined in conjunction with technology and metallurgy. The basic means of using rolling elements to overcome friction, as illustrated, is in fact ancient history. Egyptian hieroglyphics show huge blocks of stone used to build the pyramids being transported by sliding them on tree trunks acting as bearings. Another example of the use of ball bearings has been dated back to 40 BC, where the retrieval of a Roman ship found in Lake Nemi, Italy. It was discovered that wooden balls 
we use to support a rotating platform. This uh, graphic is <laughs> it's interesting, to say the least. Now, how is a bearing made? This handy little chart shows a progression of how a bearing evolves from 50 to 100 vacuum to gas tube stock through forging, turning, heat treatment, three steps of grinding, and then honing. And all of these uh, processes bring the uh, tolerances down to four to five decimal places. In addition, the rolling elements are precise to five decimal places. When you consider all of these steps, the use of high-grade steel and lubricants, and the ultimate level of precision, it is obvious that bearings are still a very good value. I've been in bearing factories, and uh, the level of skill and the technical know-how is really phenomenal. And it's all pretty much automated. Okay. Why don't we now take a look at bearing materials and components on the next slide. As you can see from the graph, graphic bearing, bearings have four major components. The outer ring fits inside of the housing. It's helpful to Define, just have an understanding of the different components. Okay. The outer ring fits inside of the housing. The inner ring fits around the shaft. The balls or rollers rotate in raceways that have been formed in the inner and outside rings. And the cage or retainer separates the balls or rollers. I should mention that. Now we're going to talk in a second about the types of materials used, but also the retainers also make a big have a big impact. Typically, they're made of uh, stamped steel, but for specialty applications, either machine bronze or TVP nylon or phenolic can also be used. The advantage of a machine bronze cage, which is typically in cylindrical roller bearings, it can take heavy loads. And the bronze actually acts as a heat sink, and it holds lubricant very well. OK, well, let's talk a little about the various types of material for the rings and rolling elements. The great majority of bearings are made from 50 to 100 vacuum degas chrome steel. One of the great uh, things that moved ahead the Industrial Revolution and then moving into the 70s and 80s was vacuum degas steel. Steel has improved, and at this point today, even some of the least expensive bearings are better than the most expensive bearings of 50 years ago. Steel has made the most dramatic improvement for bearings. While 50 to 100 steel is exceptionally suited for most applications, there are other cases where special materials are required. Criteria for these scenarios may include the need for greater corrosion resistance, higher temperature durability, lower temperature durability, grease-free use. There are some applications where grease is not allowed. You may want to slough off and get into the machinery or a food application and so on. And sometimes there's a requirement for the lightest weight possible. For critical needs, it is essential to use the right material for the proper application. Options include, and you can see some of these on the chart, but I'll explain them a little more. But actually, feel free to contact me for more in-depth information. ASI 40, 440C stainless steel. Think of this as your general purpose stainless steel. It has excellent temperature range, minus 40 to 302 F with shields, minus 22 F to 230 F with seals. <coughs> Pardon me. It's widely available in ABEC 1 to 3 classification. It's excellent for 
whether it be food processing machinery, semiconductor equipment, instrumentation, and more. The next step up would be, for certain applications, 304 stainless steel. What this does, it offers higher corrosion resistance than 440. It's resistant to acids, including chlorine, <coughs> plus caustic, pardon me, caustic soda, ammonium sulfates, and others. Non-magnetic, but stainless steel is somewhat softer in terms of Rockwell hardness. So it does have lower load rating. Now, 630 stainless steel has better corrosion resistance than 440, but it does have the advantage that it can be heat treated and hardened, and that allows it to take heavier loads and high rotation up and used for high rotation applications as well. It can be supplied with silicon nitride ceramic balls as well, and they are self-lubricating in a lot of circumstances. The real high-end material is not an alloy, it's titanium. This is a non-ferrous, unalloyed titanium metal. The advantage is it has very high tensile strength, superior corrosion resistance, and an extreme set of temperature ranges, high and low. It's also a non, uh, has no allergen reactions, which is why titanium is used in artificial joints. Naturally, the major applications are aircraft and so on. Certainly, there is a severe price uh, penalty for this type of product, but it does many things that other alloys or steels cannot do. Then we have grease-free bear free bearings. These are designed to be used where lubricants cannot be applied. In this case, the inner and outer rings and rolling elements are 440C. The retainer is 304 stainless, but has a special coating to provide lubricity. Now, going to a very expensive style, but where you need it, you need it, are full ceramic bearings. These are for extreme applications, as they have zirconia ceramic inner and outer rings with a fluorine resin retainer. The balls are typically silicone nitride. They're completely non-magnetic. They can be run without grease. Now, they are lighter, and they serve a great purpose. The caution here is that they're very brittle and must be handled with care. If you drop one, it's if you drop one, you're done. Because typically they will crack or have some micro fractures. Then the last in this little group of types of alloys are polymer ball bearings, as in plastic. These can be a very cost effective alternative. They use thermoplastic inner and outer rings. The balls can be plastic, glass, or stainless steel. The plastic balls are used for applications requiring low weight noise. Glass balls are non-magnetic, but are quite brittle, naturally. Stainless steel balls are the most durable and heat resistant. This style bearing is ideal for light loads and high speed. All of these options are typically available in radial bearings and typically ball bearings, okay? So, now moving on to bearing types and types of loading, okay? Now getting into some of the engineering of this, I know a lot of people are always interested in understanding types of loading and point contact and so on. Bearings are divided into two groups, ball and roller. The balls and ball bearings transfer the loads over very small areas with raceways. We describe this as point contact. The rollers and roller bearings transfer the loads over larger areas with the raceways. We describe this as line contact. Point contact enables ball bearings to operate at high speeds since the rolling friction is very low. The point contact limits the amount of load the bearing can accept. So ball bearings can operate fairly fast with light loads. 
line contact, as in roller bearing, whether it be a needle roller, cylindrical roller, and so on, spherical roller, line contact causes more friction, which limits the operating speed of the roller bearing. The larger contact areas also increase, however, the load carrying ability. So roller bearings operate slower but with heavier loads. Now on the types of loading, just to understand, you can see on the chart on the right side in the lower portion, radial bearings are primarily designed for carrying radial load. Radial load as defined by load perpendicular to the axis, okay, to the shaft. A thrust or axial load, that's on the arrow on the left, is a force that is parallel to the shaft. Now, on the next slide, we have a comparison of the different bearing types. Okay, what's important here is the understanding of different style bearings and accept different types of load and speed. And when a machine or a motor or different pieces of equipment are being designed, the main criteria in evaluating the design would be the mounting space or envelope dimensions, what type of load is to be carried, the speed requirements, and the level of accuracy. We know that we can use different style bearings that have the same envelope dimensions. And this chart adroitly shows the optimum use of various styles of bearings to accommodate our engineering needs. Uh, in some of these, uh, as I look at the chart, I so many times I've had applications where someone will say, well, here's what I want to accomplish, but it has to be 50 millimeters by 72 by, let's say, 12. Various bearings, whether they're angular contact, self-aligning, cylindrical, or whatever the need is, these, this chart accurately shows, in terms of the loading orientation, or the speed accommodation, what can be accomplished. So bearings really have tremendous utility, and there are so many options available. As we'll see on the next slide, which talks about bearings as building blocks. Let's first, before we get to the numbering system, which is always a question that's out there, let's go on, it, let's talk about the chart on the right, because it relates somewhat to what we were just talking about about choosing the right bearing or the right style bearing based on what it can accomplish. Bearings are really a remarkable product in that, and this is going back to the early 1900s when all these were designed, and they typically go in increments of five millimeters on the larger bearing, starting with a 20 millimeter shaft and up. And what's excellent is, as the chart shows on the right, you can have bearings with the same bore, and in this case they're showing a radial ball bearing, but you could have a cylindrical, you could have a self-aligning, you could have a spherical, and you can have all the different styles with the same bore. Conversely, you can have the same outer dimension. Let's say if you have a step shaft for some reason, <coughs> pardon me, you can accommodate different loads, and keep the same shaft. So bearing design, whoever set up the model and set up the categories did a remarkable job because this is still a very effective system 100, 120 years later. Now, one of the things we're asked frequently is regarding the numbering system. The numbering system, like people walk into our warehouse, and I'll say, oh my God, how do you keep all this stuff here? How do you organize it? The bearing world is very organized in the international numbering system. At one point, I should say that 40 years ago, there were still some ex exceptions to this system. Typically, the numbering system follows the standards set by SKF and FAG bearing. Years ago, MRC and New Departure and a few others have their own unique twist on things. But the good news is, actually the great news, is that 
people have really standardized with manufacturers and the users have standardized on this numbering system. So basically, looking at the chart here on the left, in this case it says 6 to 11, 2 NSE, M, NR, C3. Most bearings follow this standard, and the standard being the first digit tells us the engineering classification of the bearing. If there was a 1, it would be a self-aligning bearing, 1 or a 2. If it was a 3, it typically would be two rows of balls. 7 would be angular contact, and so on. A 6, in this case, what we're showing, 6 says it tells us it's a radial ball bearing. The second digit typically indicates the relative size of the outside dimension of the bearing. If you look to the right, those schematics, the cutaways of the, uh, I guess that's a blue, yellow, and green bearing, this shows the relative size when, you, when the second digit goes from a 0 to a 2 to a 3. In all cases, and this holds true whether it's a ball bearing, roller bearing, or any style of bearing, the relative size based on that second digit follows this order where the outside dimension gets bigger and the thickness increases as well. So this chart shows that pretty well. Now the last two digits, in this case it's an 11, that tells me it's a 55 millimeter bore. That's simply by multiplying the 11 by 5. And that starts, and this follows with every bearing made anywhere in the world, it starts with an 04 and up. Just because we couldn't make it so easy, there are exceptions, which you see noted there. 00, zero is always 10 millimeters, 01 is 12, 02 15, 03 is 17. But starting with an 04, it's 20 millimeters, and then it goes up in 5 millimeter increments from there based on those digits. Now, 2 NSE. In this case, this location tells you what the closures are. The vast majority of bearings do not operate open. Typically, they have shields, radio ball bearings at least. They have shields, which are metal strips that uh, are inserted into the side of the bearing, or rubber seals which ride a little tighter, although they have more friction and lower, uh, they have lower limiting speeds. So basically this location tells you, is it a shielded bearing, the 2NSE, in this case, or 2RS, which many use, ZZ, or metal shield, and so on. So that's the place where it tells you what the closure is. If there's nothing there, that means it's an open bearing. The next location, the M, where there's an M in this case, that tells us, in this case, it has a bronze cage. That's where it tells you if there's a special separator. In SKF, for years, they used a J. If it's a strip or a uh, steel cage, M is bronze. PVP is reinforced nylon, or it can be, you can also have a phenolic cage. Okay. Now, if there's an NR, that means that's a snap ring and a groove. And then lastly, and this is something we'll be touching on in a few moments, C3. C3 tells us what the internal clearance, internal radial clearance of the bearing is. Okay? And this is very critical to a successful life for a bearing. And that's something that we will touch on. But mainly this slide, uh, I think, provides a very good understanding of the numbering system. We do have charts, and they're on our website, a, numer a guide to numbering systems for all manufacturers and with interchanges. But that's something, feel free to check in with us, or you can just download it right from the website. OK? Now, moving on to the next slide showing the understanding of internal clearance. Okay. Just 
grab a sip of water here, pardon me. Internal clearance is critical to a successful bearing operation. Ball and roller bearings unmounted and mounted must have internal clearance. This clearance is an actual air gap. As bearings are mounted and pressed onto shafts, some of this air gap is removed. As bearings operate, the shaft is normally hotter than the housing, causing a thermal unbalance, which results in more clearance more removal. This, you know, makes sense. You know, the metal expands and takes out that clearance. Okay. Bearings operate best with a small amount of clearance. Internal clearance and in unmounted bearings can be felt and measured. Most bearings, as I mentioned a second ago, are C3 fit. This allows for expansion. For extreme applications, where end play and run out are critical, the design might call for a tighter tolerance, such as CO or even C2. This means it's, all, it's a relative term. That means it's simply tighter. Where the ambient temperature or running temperature is high or where the loads are severe, a C4 designation, looser clearance is specified. A good example is on shaker screens in the aggregate world. What happens basically when these are started up, I've been in these situations at electric motor rebuilders and so on, the motor will start up when it has a C4 bearing, and it sounds like a, the balls are rattling around. But after running in and after short order, everything tightens up and smooth as silk. Okay. Now, in the next slide, we talk a little about ABEC class and selecting the right ABEC class that is correct for your application. Okay, ABEC. The term ABEC and how to be informed of it can be a little confusing, it can be a point of concern and confusion. ABEC tolerances define runout, end play, and dimensions. You only need to use the level that suits your application and not more. Most bearing applications operate successfully in the ABEC 1 to 3 range. 50 or 70 years ago, most every bearing was an ABEC-1. As bearing production improved, metallurgy, uh, the ability to produce balls and uh, raceways improved, and most bearings actually today are referred to as electric motor grade. Now, if you would ask me, uh, show me the, go to Wikipedia and show me electric motor grade, what does it mean? It would be impossible. Electric motor grade is somewhat subjective. It, all these bearings have been noise tested, and they typically are close to an ABEC-3 standard. Now, for more precise applications where you need it, because there is a price premium, super precision bearings are carefully selected to optimize dimensional performance. These tight tolerances that are required would be unattainable without high quality precision bearings, usually in the ABEX 7 to 9 range. And some of the typical applications are on the left there, would be metal cutting or woodworking. Now, in the case of woodworking, they typically use an ABEX 5 bearing, but with a C3 fit. Most uh, super precision bearings are standard or CO fit. But in the case of woodworking, they require a C3 fit because of the heavy loads, and the loads produce uh, heat, so they want to accommodate there, but they want the precise runout in the woodworking field. Okay. Other applications would be high-speed turbochargers. Uh, many are using ceramics for some of these operations as well because of the you know, superior dimensional stability at elevated temperatures. Gyro stabilizers, vacuum pumps, high-speed rolling mills, printing machinery, lead screws, balancing machinery, and actually live centers. Now, one of the things that is very important that super precision bearings, ABEC 5, 7, and 9, 
be treated very gingerly. If you drop one, it's, you've taken out the precision. And one of the things, I, a little anecdote I want to offer, people have the notion that the ABEC, let's say if they have a standard motor and they say, well, I want a better bearing, okay? And they say, well, should I put in an ABEC 5 or a 7? It's really a waste of money in most cases because typically it's, you know, if you're limiting speed, if you only, if you have an application where you only need 15,000 RPM, putting in a bearing that can go 60 or 70, you've not, you know, really achieved anything. The best little example I could give about this is we're in a college town, we're here in Boston, and every week we have people, students typically, coming to our pickup counter and saying, I want to get some new bearings for my rollerblades. The rollerblade industry is standardized around a 608ZZ. That's an 8 millimeter bearing, second most popular bearing in the world. It goes into most every vacuum cleaner motor and so on. Well, they'll come in, they'll say, oh, the uh, guy at the uh, skate shop told me I should have an ABEX 7 bearing. Well, first of all, most 608ZZs that are commodity-based for rollerblades are made in China. And unfortunately, many are stamped ABEX 7, but they're certainly not because they don't have the production capacity to make 7s, typically. So they'll come in and say, oh, I was told I should have an ABEX 7 bearing, but they were like $12 each. So while I would love to sell a $12 608ZZ, the problem is that ABEX 7 and high class bearings are meant to be used in stationary housings. They're very sensitive. So I always explain to them the first time, and also I should mention that an ABEX 7 bearing might have a limiting speed of. 70,000 RPM, which they would only achieve if they were being dragged behind a Porsche. But the first time they step off a curb and step down onto the tarm with the road, basically, they've put a microscopic dent in the raceway. And they've taken the limiting speed down from 70,000 RPM to 20,000 RPM, possibly. They've made it, taken it from an ABEX 7 to an ABEX 1. So spending that $12 was a waste. We typically supply that 608ZZ for, let's say, $3, two or $3. So selecting the right ABEC class for the application is certainly critical. Also, super precision bearings provide limited runout and tolerance and zero end play in many cases. For that application, it's really essential. OK, the other thing I want to talk a minute about is a question that comes up quite often, selecting the brand and country of origin that you might feel comfortable with. Many times people will ask, which is the best bearing? While I would like to say there is a best, I cannot. Bearings have developed as a world you know, in a world marketplace. They're typically produced at the highest levels in countries that have large automobile industries in manufacturing, as they are typically the largest users of bearings. So it makes a lot of sense there. Okay? And in terms of preference and what is best, I always like to tell people, related to your thinking about cars, most every car can take you from point A to B, whether it's a BMW, a Toyota Camry, or a Hyundai. At some point, it becomes a matter of preference and comfort, and certainly economics. The same situation exists with bearing. We sell bearings that are made in Europe, Japan, and Korea. These are the really, and not in it, um, USA as well, certainly. But these are the major areas of manufacture, and it follows the auto industry. They are all what we call electric motor grade bearings and are available at various price points. So the point being, you have to find your own comfort level and also the economics of it because the difference in price is, can be dramatic. By the way, ABEC 
I get asked this a lot. Many times I've been asked, and I had to actually look it up. ABEC stands for the annual, excuse me, annular bearing engineers committee. And I just, uh, you know, check that out. I don't think I'm going to be a member of the committee, but it's good to know. We're all learning something here. Okay. Moving on to the next slide shows, talks a little about, now we're in the common sense phase of our little get together today. Okay. This talks about the importance of cleanliness when working with precision bearing. Okay. Typically, if you think of smoke or dust and so on, common household contaminants would be enough to choke off a bearing. The relative size of the contaminants can cause severe damage by creating micro denting of the raceways and the balls. And these imperfections can create, as you see in the chart, increased wear, <coughs> elevated temperatures, increased vibration, and in fact failure. Okay. Now moving on to the correct handling of precision bearings. These are some things, once again, in the common sense world, and I'm sure all of you have handled bearings, but it's always good to kind of renegotiate with yourself how you're trying to get the maximum utilization. And it's important to avoid contamination and the resultant costly premature failure of precision bearings. It's important that the parts are handled correctly throughout the entire fitment. Before commencing the fitment, it's advisable that the working environment is clean, clear of airborne contaminants, even minor dust, what you think is minor, and that the working surfaces cannot pollute the parts with rust or transferred paint chips. Even wiping a bearing clean with a cloth can introduce lint, which will result in early failure. Take great care never to drop a bearing. A drop bearing will fail and will not reach its full service life. Okay. Another little minor thing is magnetization. It's often created by static buildup. Although most quality bearings are demagnetized before shipment, induced magnetism during handling can attract particles, which will result in contamination. Now, one of the invisible destroyers of precision bearings is corrosion either through corrosive gases or more commonly through handling without protective gloves. Perspiration is highly corrosive and when coming into contact with the metal will result in corrosion which will initially be undetectable but will ultimately lead to wear. To avoid this, keep the bearings in their original wrapping until ready for the fitment and always use correct gloves when handling the parts. Sometimes we'll, I'll be out in the field and I'll evaluate a bearing that's been taken out. And one of the things I noticed is fingerprints. People don't realize the oils and the moisture in your hands and after a bearing is taken out, sometimes I'll literally see their fingerprints. All right, now in terms of the slide showing correct mounting of precision bearing, okay, this chart simply uh, confirms that you all have common sense and you would not ever want to do the wrong side of things. You want to be on the left there and the right, okay? Because uh, this is the easiest way to take out the proper service life. It's important that the correct tools are available, and that all equipment is burr-free in good working order, okay? If you have professional diagnostic equipment, such as balancers and vibration analyzers, they're invaluable. Okay, and it's important when fitting a spindle bearing especially to use an induction heater to temporarily in increase the clearance to facilitate fitment. For small shaft, small bore miniature and instrument bearings, an arbor press is typically sufficient. Okay, now some mounting of precision bearing dues. Okay, keep bearings in original packing. I mean, this might make sense, but I've been in shops or locations where bearings have been sitting out. You know, it's important to keep them properly wrapped. Handle bearings with gloves. 
when handling a bearing shaft first align the high point mark on the bearing ring. Now the little chart on the bottom, it's a good little reminder to check the shaft diameter at two positions in four planes, record these measurements for future reference, and on the bore, check your housing bore at two positions in four planes, and keep a record of those as well. Okay. Never apply, it's, okay, I, well, let me just know. And keep all this information recorded. Now moving to some of the mounting and precision bearing don'ts. Okay, once again, common sense, don't wash new bearings, don't wipe with parts of a rag, don't spin them in compressed air, and never apply shock loads. This would be the classic of dropping a bearing. Now, you would think the next little item saying don't use a hammer. Unfortunately, I have seen this happen all too often. And uh, obviously, the bearing will fail prematurely. Don't over lubricate or mix classes of lubricant. We're going to talk in a minute about lubricants. You don't want to mix different styles, whether it be sodium based or lithium based, and so on. And now, an obvious thing, but it happens. Don't smoke, eat, or drink while handling bearings. Okay, now we're going to move on to precision bearing greasing. Grease is commonly used to lubricate precision bearings. This holds several advantages over other lubricants and lubrication systems. The advantages are the bearing can be pre-lubricated. The bearing can be lubricated for life, typically when utilizing seals or shields. Or open bearings can also be shielded by utilizing what's called a nylos ring, which feel free to contact us to see if they're available for your open bearing application. And typically there's no need for a complex external lubrication system. There are cases where it is essential. Uh, we deal with a metal shredder where by running oil through the bearing system, it has the advantage of lowering the heat on the bearing dramatically. It pulls out a lot of the uh, thermal noise there. Now the five basic functions of lubrication. Once again, common sense, but it's good to remind ourselves. They reduce friction. They re reduce wear. Reduces the temperature, critical factor. Minimizes corrosion. Corrosion will lead to premature failure. And also, it seals out contamination. So we want to keep what's in working, and we want to keep all the bad stuff out. And because grease is fundamentally a lubricant with a thickener, a compound used to thicken has a significant role to play in the performance of the grease. OK? And there are different styles. Uh, we're glad to send you charts on that. We have a lot of information, which is also on our website. On now the next slide talks a little about lubrication basics. Okay, some of the terminology I just want to read to you. You don't have to be an expert on this, but it's helpful to have an understanding of what the terms mean. Okay, in terms of grease properties, viscosity. This is the measurement of a fluid's resistance to flow. A higher base oil viscosity provides increased film thickness and load carrying ability while increasing friction and heat, which happens, and reducing the, it does reduce the maximum allowable operating speed. The penetration of grease. This is a measure of the consistency of the grease and how it resists deformation under the application of force or load. The NLGI consistency grade this is a numerical scale for classifying the consistency and hardness of the greases. The dropping point, this one makes a lot of sense if you work your mind around what it's saying. This is an indicator of when a grease will flow from a bearing at operating temperatures. The dropping point is what has to be well above the maximum usable temperature of the grease. So in other words, if you, you you're in an application where it's so hot the grease starts running out, then there is a design problem and a grease problem, obviously. 
Now, one of the questions we're very often asked is how much grease do I put in? Okay. The simple guide for most applications, particularly in radial bearings, but also roller bearings, is 20 to 30 percent of the open cavity. Now you say, what's the open cavity? Well, we cheat by just simply saying, if you put the bearing lying down and the balls are facing up, if you put grease into every other ball socket, the space between the balls, on one side, that's approximately 20 to 30 percent of the open air cavity, and that's typically sufficient. One thing that's important is you don't want to over grease because if you pack the bearing full with grease, especially bearings that operate at a normal speed, slow bearings might not be as much of a factor. But one thing you want to avoid is a phenomenon called churning. Churning is where the grease builds up ahead of the balls and creates a wave. So the balls, instead of being lightly lubricated, balls are rollers, they're actually creating, they're, they're having to push through the grease, which creates heat and premature failure. Okay, the other thing I want to mention is understanding the service life of grease. Just like bearings have a typical life in terms of revolutions or hours of operation, and this is an important thing because sometimes people forget this, the same applies to grease. The service life of the grease should match that of the bearing. Years ago, there was a paper mill application that I worked on, and you know, I learned my lesson, where it was used on air chucks that were uh, used on the spindle on the rollers for winding up toilet paper at the end of the line, paper mill line. And the bearings were failing. Well, we realized after looking at it that in our design, we knew that the bearing should meet the needs that had been given to us. But the grease we supplied was not up to the task. We had not matched the service life of the grease to the service, the expected service life of the bearing. In this case, we switched over to a more technical grease. Technical in our world simply means more expensive. Made by Kluber, and we had no more failures. Okay, so this was a solution, and we hadn't really looked at the grease as in-depth as we might have. Now, the next slide talks a little about an overview. Well, there's nothing there, unfortunately, but trust me. In terms of recommended shaft housing geometries, okay, it's essential that to get long life and optimal bearing performance, you have to make sure all your tolerances on the shaft and the housing conform. And we have all these charts because what you want after you've mounted it, you want the proper internal clearance and the fit. This will certainly uh, be part of the run out and end play you achieve. The critical part is achieving the correct bearing seats on the shaft and the housing. These have to be accurately machined to match the bearing ring width and thereby maximizing the seating surface. Okay. The shaft and housing shoulders must also be high enough to provide solid seating of the bearing, but not interfere with the cages, shields, or seals. The shoulders are also important for accurate alignment of the bearing, whilst providing optimal support under maximum thrust load con conditions. And one of the simple little things I just want to mention that you all can observe next time you pick up a bearing, and hopefully with gloves. And that's what's called a chamfer radius. On the corners of a bearing, there is a rounded edge. That's called the chamfer. Now, the chamfer, if done properly, allows you to mount the bearing in an easy fashion because you have that lead chamfer allowing you to push the bearing onto the shaft or, and or into the housing. Okay? If that radius has not been what's called broken, if it's a sharp edge, it can be pretty difficult to mount that bearing. Now the only time, you know, 
as an entity, we supply people with the bearings that they ask for, and that's a price point they require. But I have to say, on the most, we only see where this edge is too sharp is on our least expensive bearings, because that's where a manufacturer might cut a corner. But the chamfer radius is critical to successful operation. We do have a catalog put out by Barden that provides all the specifications for geometry and surface finish tolerances. We'd be glad to supply it to you. Now, I, most importantly, I want to thank you all for your time and listening to Emerson Bearing's webinar and Action Bearing, serving New England, on the art of precision bearings. I hope that this was helpful to your understanding and use of precision bearings. It's a short time we have together, and I know there are going to be a lots of questions, so feel free to contact us or me personally by email, phone, fax, if you're from the old, old days, telex, but Action and Emerson Bearing websites are also there to help you as well. Our goal will always be to find the right bearing for you at the right price. And yes, it is a picture of me before surgery. I've had those bearings removed, but they were very good to me while they were there. Thank you very much for attending. Have a good day. Bye-bye.